Hello everyone, my name is Caroline Kautire and it is so nice to be here. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I would like to thank Jonathan Bourne Public Library for giving me this opportunity to share my work with you. I hope that your minds will be enlightened and that you will be inspired by my story and my journey and finding out reasons why I wrote this first book titled What Kind of Girl? So let me begin with where I am from. I am originally from Malawi, Africa. It is southeast of Africa, neighboring Mozambique, Tanzania, about a two hour flight from South Africa. And what can I say about Malawi? We were colonized by the British. We gained our independence in 1964 and I lived in Malawi for 17 years. Then at the age of 17, I moved here and I've lived here for almost 18 years now. It's actually going to be 18 years uh, in February next year. So I've kind of lived both in Malawi and America equally. They are a home for me and it's just a wonderful thing. So I would like to share this fun, fun fact about growing up in Malawi. Unlike some Malawian girls who grow up living close to their parents, I grew up living apart from mine. When I was very young, my parents sent me off to a high school private academy called Kamuzu Academy. And it's got a beautiful ornamental lake, and might I add, it is teeming with monitor lizards in it. Um, we were safe, but it's, it's kind of poor monitor when... Lizards? Monitor lizards. And um, when we would go to class, we would see their heads kind of popping up, just moving in the water, and it was very cool to see that beautiful clock tower at the top. Indeed, Malawi has its very own Harvard University. <laughs> it is a boarding school that is located six hours away from my parents' home in Blantyre, Malawi. And I was only nine years old when I went here, when I started high school. I mean, I don't know if you remember being nine years old or if you have a nine-year-old child that you, you sent to high school. It can be very frightening to send a young kid there. But I was very excited to start my adult life at nine years old. And it wasn't a bad thing. It wasn't like my parents were abandoning me. Uh, they wanted me to get the best education. So they figured sending me to um, uh, Kamuzu Academy would be a wonderful choice because I'll get the best education there and it wasn't about abandonment issues. So in case you're wondering, what was the school like? Well, Kamuzu Academy has a British prep school influence and it's very much like Harry Potter's Hogwarts but without the magic. <laughs> without the magic, please catch that part. Or if there was my magic going on, I just didn't know about it, you know? I missed the memo. I grew up at, at this school learning 15 different subjects, including Latin, French, and Greek. But when I went home on the holidays, I watched a lot of American television. So I grew up with three different cultures, British culture, American culture, and African culture. And one could say that having these three cultures clashing in my mind created a kind of confusion for the best way to behave as a girl living in Malawi. And that's what I've written about in my book, the struggle to fit into cultural norms. So why did I write this book? Why did I become a writer? Well, that's first of all, before I continue with why I wrote this book and why I became a writer, that's me at nine years old. I was probably very tired from a road race I ran and that's our uniform, kind of green and gold colors. And a, we had a blazer and a nice hat, um, and I'm looking cheesy, but that's young Caroline at Kamuzu Academy. So I have, to, I have to confess, the first thing you need to know is that I was never a good writer when I was young. I failed English composition all the time um, before I could eventually succeed to become the author that I am today. Maybe I was too young to understand grammar, but the struggle was definitely there. The American science fiction author Octavia Butler says, you don't start out writing good stuff. You start out writing crap and thinking it's good stuff. <laughs> and then gradually you get better at it. 
That's why I say one of the most valuable traits is persistence. This quote captures the essence of what I have experienced as an author. I am living proof that sometimes what seems like failure is preparation for you to become something greater than what you imagined. I once failed at writing, but my persistence turned the girl who could not write into a published author. Secondly, identity is something that has always fascinated me because it is very flexible. And I'm going to show you something. That is me. You recognize young Caroline, but that is me with my hair shaved off, and that is me with long, beautiful hair. Um, people always talk about how I wax and wane between masculinity and femininity, and I embrace both because identity is that flexible. And I could do it with clothing, too. Uh, I dress how I feel, and I play with it. And one thing I can say is, because I asked many questions about myself at a young age, I became drawn to finding ways to assert myself, ways to take up space to say, I am here, and I have something to offer. Yet, I also wondered if other people struggled with growing up. So writing this book was my way of coming to terms with my own upbringing. It has given me the chance to psychoanalyze myself publicly, to overcome frustrations publicly, and to reclaim the identity that I once repressed. Flash forward 10 years after moving to America, I found myself as a young professor. And everyone envied me. They applauded me for finding out what I wanted to do at such a young age. But there was a problem. I didn't really know who I was or what I wanted to do. Partly because I grew up watching television and I identified with role models like Angela Bassett, Felicia Rashad, Halle Berry. And then I had a high school prep style lifestyle, which uh, again is kind of like Harry Potter. But my point is that I wasn't in tune with my African roots. This made me feel very empty. And even though people felt I was seizing the American dream by being this young professor, something was still missing. So I decided to visit Malawi after being away from it for so long. And when I arrived, just being home, being around the people and the different traditions reawakened in me the purpose that I came to America for. Suddenly, I wanted to write about what I was experiencing. Playing with the kids in the villages humbled me. So the kids kind of lived in the rural areas. I lived in the city. So I'd go and play with them, would play soccer, basketball, all sorts of different sports. I would buy them food and they would be so shocked, like, why are you hanging out with us? Don't you have a fancy restaurant to hang out in? And I say, no, I want to hang out with you guys. And, you know, I stopped worrying about all the little things when I was around them because they would appreciate so easily with very little. So I got over myself because I was hanging around these kids in the village. So then I started documenting my experiences and sharing them on social media. I wanted people to learn about Malawi, about how people were experiencing me, either the way they celebrated me or the way they alienated me. Because not everybody could identify with me. They said, you're not Malawian enough. You're not African enough. There's something about you. I was even criticized for the way I walk. They said, I walk in a straight line. That's not Malawian. And I said, then how do Malawians walk? You know, should I be falling all over the place and that's Malawian? It's very fascinating to me. So after all, what does it mean to be Malawian, to be authentically African? I'm constantly asking myself this question. Before I knew it, people started asking me for a book. They wanted more. So I enrolled at Emerson College where I learned how to write creatively. Now, mind you, I was used to critiquing literary works, but to think creatively, to come up with something imaginative and moving, I had to think differently. And I needed a plan. So what did I do? I read other authors' memoirs and books. I read memoirs by Maya Angelou, Roxane Gay, and Trevor Noah, and even dabbled in the fiction of Toni Morrison, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. From them, I learned how to write clean, crisp sentences. I learned how to write vivid and provocative metaphors. And like Trevor Noah, 
I reached for this charming yet raw honesty that can be difficult to sometimes share with the rest of the world. The workshops at Emerson were part of my journey to write this memoir. My professors and my classmates were my first rented audience to help me assess if what I was communicating was indeed accurate. This was my first step to write something publishable, and it took me about a year to finish writing What Kind of Girl. I then queried many different agents, and I sent my manuscript to publishers who didn't require that I need an agent. Many of them rejected me. I, some of them were just not a good fit. Some said, hey, you've got something good going on here, but you just need to have more of a presence on social media. You need to do a lot more talks like the one I'm doing right now so that you can build your profile as an author. I struggled with this part of my journey because it reminded me of how I once failed English composition in high school. But nevertheless, I persisted until Austin Macaulay Publishers took me on. On July 31st, 2020, I published What Kind of Girl. Thank you. So what should you expect to find in my book? Or what do I hope people will take away from it? Well, my book not only challenges the confining gender roles placed upon young women by traditional religious and cultural ideas, but also the problem of stereotypical gender itself that still looms everywhere. Gender is a social construct. And I remember reading something about conventions by the Nigerian writer Chimamanda Adichie. She said, convention is something made up by somebody and then others repeat it. But if you feel there is something wrong, you must stop and act. As a child, I did exactly that. I took risks hoping to find myself, to express myself honestly. And indeed, I wasn't like other girls. I struggled with my own body image, with language, with my place in society, and I turned to TV icons instead. Like I said, identity is malleable. We can keep creating who we want to be until we are comfortable in our own skin. I also discuss traditions in different traditions in the book, different expectations for young girls. There's a chapter where I rebel against my mother's request for me to cook an African dish called nsima and to wear an African wrap called a chitenji. I'll show you each one of these things. We'll start with nsima. So the nsima is a dish where you take cornmeal and you put it in hot boiling water, and you cook it until it gets to this dough-like state. And you eat it with ndiwo, which is kind of like relish. You, you can have a beef stew or chicken stew or vegetables. You eat it together, kind of like Nigerian fufu. Now, the problem with cooking sima is that when it gets to the porridge state and it's bubbling everywhere, it can bubble onto your skin and cause a blister. This I did not like. <laughs> Therefore, I didn't want to cook, right? So that's nsima, um, and it's a very popular dish in Malawi. And the second thing I described was a chitenje, which is an African wrap. You can wrap it around yourself when you're working, doing chores in your home. Um, some people use it as a baby sling to carry your baby, and you can work um, whilst carrying the baby with the chitenje. Some use it as a, a head wrap. I usually wear head wraps. Um, uh, and you can see it's very colorful, bright, intricate patterns. I hated that at first. Uh, colors are very bold. And I think with my insecurities, today I can reflect and, and, and tell you that having insecurities about myself made me not wear bright, colorful clothes uh, because I just didn't know how to assert myself, how to own it and enjoy it and, and look beautiful. Right? There's so much. Part of the reason why I didn't like these things is that I was in boarding school, too, and wasn't accustomed to cooking. So in, in boarding school, I was in class or playing sports. I wasn't in the kitchen cooking like most girls. right? And I was a tiny tomboy, too. And when I tried to wear African wraps, I looked awkward. So I just resulted to hating it. There's a chapter where our house got broken into by 50 plus thieves, and I saved my family at the age of six. 
I'm not going to tell you how because I want you to read the book. <laughs> but it was horrifying. And though this exper in this experience, I learned about class as well. Growing up in big fancy houses can be exciting, but it was something that was frustrating for me because it attracted danger. Poverty drove people to break into houses. And one of the reasons for wishing to move to America was to find safer grounds to live in. But make no mistake, Malawi is a beautiful place. You know, the people there, rich or poor, have figured out how to live a good life. Yet for me, the trauma from that robbery still stands. But I'm less scared in America. There's a chapter where I was sent to a Catholic female grooming school where I was meant to learn how to behave like a girl. And I argued with the nuns like my life depended on it. <laughs> The criteria for distinguishing boys from girls just seemed obscure. It highlighted issues regarding incest, too, because it was a major concern. Yet though I challenged many ideas, thinking myself to be a woke 10-year-old, I eventually realized the need to learn what I was being told. Maybe the approach in how we should share ideas about young girls needs to change. Something needs to be modified. Because, as my book synopsis says, being a girl and growing up can be confusing. Finally, what kind of girl isn't a story about stereotypical Africa with catastrophes only? Instead, it encourages a recognition of our equal humanity, emphasizing how we are similar rather than different no matter where we come from. It is a step outside of what Chimamanda Adichie calls the danger of a single story. Stereotypes are incomplete stories, and they rob people of dignity. So I don't want people to only learn about stereotypical stories about Africa. There are so many different narratives, and I want people to find a connection between cultures by identifying with a young African girl's story. I hope it inspires self-reflection. I hope people learn about Malawian traditions and even the language, because my book is written in English and it's laced with Chichewa. This is my response to Trevor Noah's words about language, because language does bring with it identity and culture. A shared language says we are the same. A language barrier says we are different. My book shares the Chichera language with you. I hope parents can gain insight about a child's interiority and how they can adopt good parenting strategies so that their child grows up with good mental health. And young men and women can also reflect on their upbringing and decide what kind of person they want to be as a result of reading my story. So I'd like to read a little short excerpt. I, I picked a nice short section, about two paragraphs or so, um, so you can get a sense of my writing style. Right? So this is from a chapter titled Kamuzu Academy. That's my high school, the one that I went to. Um, and in this particular scene, we are, we are at a, what, what is known as a beep test. You'll find out what it's about. And people kind of like heckle me, they make fun of me. And the reasons you will find out from my reading. We spoke more British than American English, using words like pupil instead of student, break time instead of recess, term instead of semester. And we played British sports like badminton, rugby, and netball, which sparked my athleticism. I spent a lot of time at the school pavilion because sports made me feel alive. It also reminded me of playing with the boys in my neighborhood in Sunnyside. Almost every term, I was the captain of the sports team. The only games I wasn't good at were volleyball and tennis. I wasn't terrible at them, but I couldn't master them as well as netball, basketball, and badminton. At KA, the boys were similar to the ones in my neighborhood. They either liked that I was ruthless at sports or they did everything they could to make me feel awkward about my skills. Once the boys and girls had to participate in an exercise called the beep test. 
It involved running from one side of the soccer field to the other at the sound of a beep. The sound came from our coach's car, which was parked a few feet from us with the volume on blast. Beep, we ran. Beep, we ran. Beep, we ran. After each interval, the beeps got faster and faster, leaving no time to catch our breath. If you failed to make the timing of the beeps, you could surrender and walk off the field. On this particular day, the sun was out and the field was almost empty. Three out of 30 students kept running and I was one of them. We were down to two boys and one girl. My legs were exhausted. I was sweating profusely and I could barely catch my breath. At first, the girls and some of the boys cheered me on. But when the last boy and me were left running, some of the boys started jeering. Ah, ah, Carol, that's enough. You are not a boy, someone said. You're making us look bad. Watopa basi, another one said, advising me to get tired. Once the boy I was running with surrendered, all I could hear were cusses and clucks, mostly words that questioned my femininity. How I ran like a boy. How I was showing off by trying hard. How some boys would never ask me out on a date. It seemed as if the more I ran and did well in sports, the less female I was becoming, the less attractive. And that afternoon, as I ran alone on that soccer field, with my coach and a few girls applauding me, I will never forget how I stopped, not because I couldn't run anymore, but because I was afraid to be strong in front of the boys. So that is just one example of what I had to go through in boarding school. Um, in this book, I do a lot of pretending. Pretending became my new identity because yes, I was very young and um, all the other girls were growing up faster than me and I thought there was something wrong with me because it was just an age thing. So pretending was like my new identity. And for me to actually be here today and be honest about all of this, you have no idea how much of a relief it is to finally say, I was in there in all that pretense. I was in there, this Caroline uh, that you're seeing today. Um, and you know, it's like I said, a book that helped me come to terms with a lot of things, the bullying, um, the questioning, what kind of girl am I, you know, that I feel I've, I've healed, I've come to terms with it, and it, it feels good to talk about it. It feels, it feels good to talk about it. I have written a sequel. Yes. Yeah. Titled Some Kind of Girl, and this will be out early next year. Let me show you the cover. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> That is, that is me, <laughs> uh, with the long hair this time, very different from uh, this cover. Uh, so, like I said, identity is very malleable, so, you know, hair is just part of it, one thing. And people always ask me, does your personality change when your hair changes? And um, I don't know, maybe, um, but I'm still the same person. But maybe uh, some parts of my personality are accentuated more than others. Um, and you, you have a different fierceness to you. You just have to own it, no matter what happens here. <laughs> so what is it about? It is about what happened from the time that I moved to America and how I took many risks to adapt to a new culture, the, Amer the American culture. Um, and I hope that you will read my first book so that you can see how far I have come. Um, in the second book, just to give you highlights, um, it's a lot, a, a lot of the similar things themes from the first one, but um, I talk about education a lot. I talk about the immigration system a, a little bit and how that was very difficult for me to navigate, but I did it. And I actually have some wonderful news. I just recently got approved for my green card after 18 years. Oh. Yes. Yeah, so if I can do it, other people can do it too, legally, very well. Yes. Um, and you know, it's just a matter of sharing this information, and I think I will be sharing my story too. 
Um, I'm currently living the third book right now, so, <laughs> so I, I definitely will keep that in mind. Um, I have to say one more thing before I let you guys go. Um, today, both Malawi and America are my homes. And for a diaspora individual, this expands my identity. But sometimes I don't fit in anywhere. I am always an outsider. Home is no longer just a physical space, but a sense of belonging. And today, I crave connection because anyone, any one of you at any time can feel like home to me. Thank you. Thank you because I if you don't know, in her TED Talk, she talks about the danger of there only being one narrative and how it shapes your perspective and how can you possibly know anything else about another person or culture or country if we're only receiving one narrative, right? And I was honest, I showed your book to my kids and said, I didn't know anything or what to expect about Malawi until I read this book. Right. And they were so excited and wanted to Zoom with you. Um, so I was so thrilled to see her up there and I can't wait, I just want to say that I can't wait to go tell my kids, hey, you know that TED Talk we watched and you know my friend? Well, that's who inspired her writing. And then the second one is, um, one of your chapters of your book is called Shakespeare Taught Me, How to, Taught Me English. And I didn't know if you would be willing to expand on it a little bit because it's just so good. I know, I know you don't want to give away the whole book, but if no, you wanted to talk about Shakespeare and his influence in your life, I would love for you to share that with everyone. Yes, so a uh, very fascinating thing too because so Shakespearean syntax, the sentence structure, the way Shakespeare writes, um, is something that is almost jumbled up. It can be very difficult to kind of figure out the words are back to front, some, you know, the word that should be in the front is at the end of the sentence, and it's almost like a puzzle that you have to figure out. And so Shakespearean set syntax helped me to figure out subject, verb, object agreement. It was like a puzzle for me to try and make sense of it into modern English, right? Because his is early modern English, so late modern English. How do you, how do you change that? You know, so that's one thing that kind of helped me. But also, the stories are so rich. I feel Shakespeare makes you smarter. He just understood human nature, the human condition. And because I was a child that was interested in psychology, interested in why people do what they do, from a very young age, I just loved questioning why people do what they do. Shakespeare gave me a lot of information that I wanted to write very well about. So I'd spend time with you know reading his books, understanding his stories, uh, the teachers knew I secretly liked Shakespeare because he wasn't supposed to be this popular thing. He was supposed to be this boring, dry old man that wrote the stuff <laughs> that has nothing to do with anybody. But it had everything to do with me because it was giving me insight into the human condition. And also his syntax was something I like to play around with. So we all have our own little things that, you know, peer pressure, they can say you shouldn't like that. I secretly like Shakespeare and it actually helped me out. When I, when I moved here, and I found out that there were teachers that were passionate about it. Steve Dooner, who was a huge influence in my life, my very first mentor, uh, uh, taught me Shakespeare. And uh, I started a drama club sur uh, surrounding kind of Shakespeare as our main thing. And all of that was part of what has helped me become a writer, believe it or not. Um, so that's as little as I will share, yeah. um, <laughs> you know. But yes, Shakespeare is somebody who has been very crucial in my life. Interesting because. You would expect maybe like uh, a, a contemporary, like a 2021 writer who has influenced me, but it, it, it was actually Shakespeare who, was, who initiated this love for literature and writing. Thank you. Thank you for asking me. Thank you. Appreciate it. I just thought, <clears throat> combining your love for theater and your books, why don't you write a screenplay? Wow, it's almost like you're looking into my future. So I don't know if I should be saying this right now, but as of now, I'm actually, t um, I recently have been connected with Brown University Alumni Association. So I am connected to a lot of TV executives right now that I'm actually talking to. And uh, they've all pitched different angles for how to turn what kind of girl and some kind of girl into a uh, a TV series. Wow. So right now I've had two TV executives who have read both What Kind of Girl and Some Kind of Girl. Um, as of January we will start writing a pilot script. Um, so this is something that I'm going to be 
trying my best to put out there. So it's interesting that you're asking that yeah, because to that me, I is, see it right away. Is like you a see Netflix, it right away. A Netflix, you know, mini series or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So it's so cool. it's very interesting. And since some kind of girl, my second book is based in America. It'll be easier to shoot here, so that might be the primary story, and we'll be flashing back to what kind of girl to give the African um, narrative as well. So the two, the two books were written at the same time at Emerson. They used to be one. They used oh. to be. They were written at the same time, and then when I needed a thesis, <laughs> I said, "Okay, why don't I separate what happens in Malawi in Malawi, what happens in Mer in America separately?" So. You know, when you one book and created two. And created two. Uh, when you read them, a lot of people say they feel like they go together. Okay. So that's wonderful because this the TV series will work out pretty well. And I have to say, because we're already here, I would find Malawi as more interesting to watch on TV. We already know what goes on here. Yes. We I love to see what went on there. Yes, and, and I think that the 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 flashing back and forth is is I think the marriage of the two. Um, and we'll see. That's just like one take that I've been hearing a lot to say, oh, it would be easier to shoot this way because I also need to know what kind of works already. I'm learning from a lot of these TV executives because I'm not really um, fluent at what exactly works on screen and what doesn't. But I, that's exactly what I would want people to see more of too, right. Malawi. Right. If you've heard of the boy who harnessed the wind, yes. Um, mm -hmm. You will also know that his book was turned into a Netflix movie uh, that you can watch. It's by William Kamkwamba, and he's also from Malawi. And um, he actually went to school in Dartmouth, uh, mm -hmm. I hear, and he visited not too long ago. I've never met him, and I feel we should because mm -hmm. two Malawian authors, you know, in Massachusetts, we can we can definitely do something with that. Um, and so, if he can do it, I can do it too. But I'll put my own spin in his book was just in Malawi. Chiwetel Ejiofor is a guy that, um, very famous British, Nigerian, I think, um, director and actor, uh, produced his mm -hmm. movie. So we'll see what happens with my, with my connections. Mm -hmm. that, and that's the story, he brought electricity to his village, right? Yes. Yeah, he made a windmill from like, scratch. He, he made a windmill, yes, from yeah. scratch. Remarkable story yeah. that I recommend. It's on Netflix. Mm -hmm. It's called The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. Yeah. Yeah. Is your family still in Malawi or are they here? So yes, most of my family, they live in Malawi and um, I have one brother that lives in Stoughton. Um, everybody else, I know, right? So random. Everybody else is living in Malawi. It's such an exciting time. And the news that I've told you, literally tomorrow, my green card arrives tomorrow. Oh, okay. So it's like the most amazing thing. and. Um, I think I'll be doing a lot more talks about that too, kind of like how I adapted to the new culture um, when I start talking about my second book. I just want to help people who want to come here and, and do it the right way, you know. Um, America doesn't have to be painful like that. Yes, maybe the immigration system can be very difficult to navigate, but I did it without a sponsor. I did it without an attorney, no lawyers. I did it all myself just by researching it. You know, and it's very difficult. I see why the need for attorneys and everything like that. But it's also nice to kind of have self-knowledge about what's going on with you and not just kind of let America happen to you. Like be a part of it and, and know why the laws are the way they are and who it's helping. Um, so I, I would love to speak about that a little bit more at some point uh, when, I, when I'm talking about my second book. Mm -hmm. Yes. I have Two quick questions. One, I was reading the flyer for your talk tonight, and it said something about that you do flash fiction. Flash fiction. And I have no idea what that is. What is that? Okay, so flash fiction is like uh, it can be. It can kind of vary. You can have a one hundred word story. You can have a two hundred and fifty word story. But it's kind of like a shorter form of a short story. Um, so. I, the ones that I do are 100 word stories. So you will find that my the whole story will have a plot, you will have the exposition, rising action, the climax, the denouement to the resolution um, in, a hun in a hundred words. Oh. I can do that. Um, there's other flash fiction that has more words, you can do 1,000 words, there's so many different ones, but it's just a shorter form of a short story. 
Um, and so that's it, it. It really has taught me how to how to get to the point quickly. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like Twitter too. Twitter is <laughs> Twitter. <laughs> Twitter. Twitter will teach you how to how to be a flash fiction writer very fast because it's like <laughs> discipline. 140 characters. <laughs> so the second question has to do with the target. Uh, who is the target audience for your book? For what kind, what of, girl? kind of girl? Okay, so my target audience, I was, initially I was thinking YA, like young adults, mm -hmm. you know, but it's also a book that can help, especially like immigrants, um, those who want to come out here or those who have, have felt like they want to go elsewhere because you're not fitting into their own cultures and everything like that. Um, so I think also ages, I would say age, t starting from age 10, I think you can handle my book because that's, that's the age that I was in boarding school and everything like that. Um, and you know, I think kids are getting younger and younger nowadays when they're going to school. Um, and I think all the way until, you know, 30s, but there, a lot of older people love this book, I would tell you, because it's insightful into a child's interiority. So parents can love a book like this too because they can learn something about their children and what's going on with them. Um, yeah. Like I said in the end about like mental health. Um, and, and the one reason I'm asking is because I have three granddaughters, 14, 16, 17, mm -hmm. and some of the issues or passages that you went through, I mean, they, they're just not, um, that many girls go through, yeah, go right. through this. Yeah. Right. I didn't want to say it like that. Yeah. It wasn't just you, but you know, right. many sure. girls do. So I was thinking, well, maybe they find inspiration from right. Mm -hmm. um, and also, like college, like college students, high school students, college students. It's a book that I think is so accessible for schools. You know, because it's it's easy to read. I've heard that it's it's you read it pretty fast. Um, and it's also something that can be turned into like a literary work that you can do a character analysis if you want to um, as well. And you know, you're, it's written in small vignettes. You don't have to be married to it all the way. You can just read a vignette at a time. It's, it, would, it would just be easy to teach. To, as a teacher, I find it to be easy to teach in terms of the way I structured it in the vignettes. And just knowing like attention span nowadays is like an issue. Um, so my granddaughters, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I think it's definitely wonderful for schools, high schools, even in college, um, when when um, kids are transitioning from high school and entering college. I think that would be a wonderful age to kind of. Um, Thank you. You say you, you were concerned because you were faster than the boys. You smarter than the boys. <laughs> <laughs> because that's just as big. I mean. You know, there's plenty of girls who don't say anything in class because right. they don't want to be seen as, you know, right. I don't know if that's still true, but it was when I was there. Right. Um, no, I, real, I realize all of that today. And I think even the title, What Kind of Girl, it's just for, you know, when we're young, kids are mean. Kids can be that's really so mean right. to <laughs> each other. They can say some really mean things and, you know, they're trying to be honest, they're trying to figure it out in the process, they don't know the impact of their language, um, you know, and it's, it, it can leave scars for some people. And for me, just to be asked what kind of girl does that, you know, who are you, who does something like that, always made me feel like I was an anomaly, like there's something really wrong with me. Just, you know, and to live like that, you know, you, you can really block yourself from the light that you have that you can give to other people. Um, and I don't want other people to go through that. I don't want other young, young kids to go through that. There's a poem by Marge Piercy titled Barbie Doll. And in Barbie Doll, th this girl was told that she had a big nose and fat thighs. And she changed herself entirely. That uh, the only time she actually really looked beautiful and people said, wow, doesn't she look beautiful? Is when she was dead in a casket and she has completely oh, wow. changed her entire body. And when I studied that poem, it kind of shook me, and it makes me think of my book and how I want to use it too. You know, for anybody who has been told, like, you know, terrible things 
about themselves, about their identity, or why they are the way they are. Um, I just, I, I want the book to make them feel like they're not alone and that they can speak up about this stuff. They can reach out to their parents. They can talk about it with their friends. It's not awkward to do that because for me it was awkward and I didn't talk to anyone and I internalized a lot of terrible things that have probably given me PTSD today. Um, and it manifests even in my older age. Like when my house got broken into at the age of six, I still have nightmares till today. I see my house getting broken into and I'm waking up. If, if I'm stressed, it manifests as a nightmare of somebody breaking into the house every single time, you know. Um, so what happens to us at a young age can definitely, we, can, we carry it into our, our old age and we, we realize that we need it to kind of process some of this stuff. And what kind of girl can be a book that can give you that trigger to say maybe I need to talk about this. It can be therapy, you know, uh, talking to someone. Um, it's, it's, it's a conversation starter, this book. It's a conversation starter. I don't tell people what to do. I don't know if, when you read it, you'll notice that. I don't tell anybody, this is how you ought to live. No. I say, here's an experience. What do you get from it? Or who are you in all of this? Did you go through the same thing? How are you living, is the question that I'm asking people. Mm -hmm. It's a great book. I'll just go ahead and say that again. <laughs> it's really good. I'm going to add to it, Caroline. You know I'm going to have to say something. Um, I read the book and I feel like I really self-identified with a lot of what you went through. So whether we are Malawian or American, we're women. And I think a lot of what you experienced, we all experienced in some way or another. So I think culturally and by way of diversity, there's so much to be learned through your writing. Right. And you're talented and you're raw and you're honest. and. You're fab. Thank we you. love you. <laughs> it's, and just listening to you, thank you so much for saying that. It's, it's the fear of, of the other, mm -hmm. right? Um, er, people are uh, othering other people be, and, and being afraid of them and discriminating against them because you know people fear what they can't understand. So it's easier to just put them over there, put it away, we don't want to see it and whatnot. And I want to be a voice for anybody that has ever been put in that category of other, you know, uh, because we've all been the other in, in one way or another in some situation. In one room, you know, some people can be, you know, the famous person, the popular person. In another room, you are the other. In another, in, in one point or another, we've, we've been an other at some point, you know. And I want to keep that conversation going. And that's, that's the stuff that I like to talk about. So you, you just kind of reminded me of that um, It's something that's important for me. Yes? Just curious, why did you come to America instead of Britain, if you are already have learned in the British system? That is true, and I really would love to go there because, yes, all my teachers, you know, the British teachers, um, definitely inspired me to go there. But my brothers came here. There was America, too. And there's this place called Harvard University that is popular <laughs> in Massachusetts. So it's like, oh, that's where all the good schools are? All right, America it is. So I just kind of like followed the footsteps. And like I said, I was watching a lot of American television. So I was like, I got to go. This is where my life is. You know, I will find myself there because the life I'm living in Malawi is not cutting it. I'm not a shy, passive, submissive woman who is just going to shut up and not say anything about how I feel what I'm thinking. So I said, look at these women on TV. That's what I want to be. I want to be able to tell somebody what I'm thinking. Uh, America is where I'll do it. Who were your favorites? That's, that's why the first chapter is titled, Oh Hell No. <laughs> Wagging your finger. <laughs> Wagging my finger and all of that. The, you know, Halle Berry, Angela Bassett I loved, um, Halle Berry. Um, I did grow up watching Felicia Rashad as well, um, Whoopi oh, Goldberg, right. Sister Act. I remember Sister Act was oh, like a wonderful that. one. Um, I also then had another side, Sound of Music, mm -hmm. you know, Julie Andrews. Um, and then I watched a lot of sitcoms as well. Uh, what's this? Um, Fresh Prince of Bel Air, there. Mm -hmm. um, loved that one. Family Matters. You know, so all of that, when I, when I saw the domestic areas and how they were living and, you know, women just, just having 
uh, their own voice. I wanted that too, and that's what brought me to America. I said, I'll be able to talk there. Yeah. yeah. And look at me now. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here.